Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman and the secretary of a cycling club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Cuxford Cycle Club? Oh, yes. Hello. I'm calling to inquire about joining the club. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, I wanted to get a picture of what the club is like. For example, how big it is? Now, that changes each year, of course. Cycling is growing in popularity. I'm sure. So, last year we had nearly 70 members, which was a record in itself. But this year, there are 76 people on the list, and I'd say at least 60 of them come to events regularly. I should think something like 85 is a likely figure by next year. That's bigger than I expected. Yes, there are plenty of opportunities to meet people. And how much does it cost to join? It depends. £40 is for standard members and there are reductions for certain categories. For example, veteran and youth members pay £10 less, £30. And family membership works out at £25 per head. All those charges are per year. And youth means? Under 18. Oh, that covers me, at least at the moment. <laughs> then, for safety reasons, your application will need to be endorsed, so your teacher or parent needs to sign your form. No problem. So, what happens after I've sent the form in to you? We deal with it and get a confirmation of acceptance with a membership card out to you in three weeks, and then you're ready to ride. It lasts a year, and we send you a renewal one month before it's due to expire. OK. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. And can you tell me something about the activities you do? Yes, there's a range of things to reflect the varied membership. There are the family rides, which are pretty popular, held every month, and that might get increased to every two weeks. I don't know if that's really for me. Hmm. You might prefer the Saturday rides, which are more popular with the youth members. We don't go huge distances, 100 kilometres or anything like that. 60 kilometres is about average but the pace is fairly brisk. Let's hope I'll be able to keep up. <laughs> oh, actually, there's something I should have mentioned before. We've got to be sure everyone's bike is roadworthy, so you'll need to have your bike checked and obtain a safety certificate for it. Most bike shops will do that for you. Fine. Do you do any longer tours, like holidays? Yes. There's a camping tour at least twice a year. There's one on July the 14th, though it will get booked up very soon. If you miss that, then there's another on August the 17th. Oh, good. But obviously there's plenty going on before then. You might want to come along on May the 5th. Your membership should be through by then, and that's when we have a picnic. Everyone brings some food to share, and we go out to the hills and eat there. That sounds fun. I'm going to fill in my form as soon as I get off the phone. And a further benefit of membership is the discount with wheels. The shop on Mill Road? Yes, the manager's a member of the club and he'll give you a 15% reduction.
It means membership can pay for itself. Great. Well, you'll be getting my form soon. Good. I look forward to meeting you. That is the end of part one. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk given to a group of international students about banking. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello! Wow! Nice to see all you international students here today. Thanks for coming. I'm Penny from Finance. I wasn't expecting so many. They told me 30, but there must be at least 50. Anyway, for many, if not most of you, this is your first time in Australia. You may find our banking system similar to yours. Anyway, if you have any questions, could you leave them till the end? OK then. Well, step one for most international students is to open an account. Some of you have brought cash over from your country and, having worked with international student accounts for many years, I can tell you that the money often goes missing. Even if only for safety's sake, open a bank account. It's the safest place to put your money. Now in Australia we have four main banks and lucky for you all four are within walking distance of the school. First off, in Scarborough Street we have the United Global Bank or UGB as we call it. Next we have the International Bank. When you walk into Pacific Plaza you can't miss the big red sign on your right. The Pacific Bank is located in Key Plaza, just 100 metres down the street, and Town Bank, another international bank, is in Southport Park. Now, one of my jobs in student services is to locate the best bank accounts for our students from the neighbouring banks. I am happy to say that the banks in this area are quite competitive and I've managed to locate three excellent accounts with various pros and cons. The first two are from the UGB. Firstly, the EasySaver account is very popular among international students. The reason for this is the low fees and the 10 ATM withdrawals per month. The other account that does well is the QuickSaver. The main reason for this is because once you open an account, there are no fees for the first six months. No one wants to pay fees, right? Now, the International Bank has what they call a student savings account. This account has been quite successful among our international students as well, especially for those who need a checking facility. The account offers a checkbook at no additional cost to you. The last of the popular student accounts is a study account, which is offered by Pacific Bank. The main advantage with this one is that the account can be linked to a credit card, which can also be helpful for students. Before you listen to the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. A lot of people when they go to a bank to open an account take with them all sorts of documents. I've seen some students take restaurant bill statements, rental agreements, even video rental cards. Well these are not suitable for opening a bank account. When it comes to opening an account, just remember the 100 point system. Some items get higher points than others, but basically you can't go wrong with your passport as the primary form of identification. I think that's worth 75 points. Some students have a driver's license. This is a good secondary form of identification and it's worth 30 points. Another one that works well is a phone bill with your address on it. Any of these items will easily get you the 100 points needed to open an account. OK, that finishes my part of the lecture. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a student of landscape architecture discussing a project with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. So, let's hear what you're doing for your next project. I've decided to design a roof garden for a supermarket. I've been looking at some on the web and I think that a garden on top of a building is the up and coming thing. OK. So you've done a bit of reading already? Mm-hmm. What benefits would there be for the client? Why do you think a supermarket chain would be willing to meet the expense of construction? You do realise that would be the first thing they raise. <laughs> yes, I know. But I'd explain that in spite of the initially high expense, they would save that much in approximately five years. Hmm. Well, I'd have to do sums. I mean, calculate specifically. Yes. How would the saving come about? Mainly through lower heating and aircon bills. Uh -huh. The extra insulation offered by having a layer of living plants in the soil would make a huge difference. OK. But they might feel the expense of maintenance would be an issue. After all, supermarkets don't normally employ gardeners. What I thought was, if they made it a community garden, rather than a simple low-maintenance green roof... So there'd be public access? Oh, yes. Ah. Then there'd be a sense of ownership in the local community, and people could take responsibility for it, instead of the supermarket paying a commercial company, and it would really boost their public relations. That's a good point. And have you been looking into how roof gardens are built nowadays? I'm still exploring that. But if I take advantage of the latest technologies for roof gardens, it shouldn't be too difficult. But in any case, you have to use lightweight materials. But that's a matter of making the right choices. You can even use quite traditional ones, such as wood, for the planting areas. Yes, that's what I thought. It'll look good, and it isn't too heavy. 
But for the basic construction, the issue you have to address first is the material used between the building and the garden. You mean the barrier fabric,、mm. which ensures there's no chance of rainwater leaking down into the building. Yes. Nowadays, that is very good and quite easily sourced. Then, on the other hand, there's the business of water within the roof garden itself. Ah,、uh, you mean drainage?、Mm. That's an important feature of the construction in any roof design. Yes, but I think most drainage issues have been well understood for quite a long time. Okay, but another thing is with plants in an exposed situation, you usually need to find ways to optimize rainfall. Yes, because rainwater is best for the garden if you can store it for when it's needed. What I've been looking at are some buildings which use fairly conventional storage tanks, the kind that have been in use for decades, but have them linked to modern automatic watering systems. Sounds complicated. <laughs> It's less so in practice than it sounds. I think. I've been researching them, and actually, the latest ones definitely work very well, and they can be electronically regulated to suit the local microclimate.、Mm, that sounds interesting. You seem to have been doing some thorough research. <laughs> Make sure you reference all your sources when you write it up. Yes, sure.、Um, uh, there's one more aspect I'd just like to run past you if there's time. I want to include a light feature in the design. Ah, of course. I've got a sketch here. Let's have a look then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Well, I was really impressed by something I saw on a roof in Cornwall, and I'd like to design something similar.、Um, you have an area of planting, and I'm thinking of installing this lighting in an area filled with low-growing evergreen shrubs. Hmm. You'd have to have lights and things well away from anywhere children might be, but I can see this could be very effective, if a bit complicated. How would it work? On this drawing, this is a section view.、Hmm. You have this low wall on the right. Yes, that's it. This is just one element, and these areas would be repeated all round the planted area. I think this will probably be a wooden wall using reclaimed timbers, with an angled ceramic top surface. Perhaps even ridge tiles, like they use on roofs. Ah,、oh, yes, that'd be just the sort of thing,、mm. <laughs> and that'd make it weatherproof.、Um, and then the heavy-duty electric wiring comes up through the floor just outside the planted area and into the wall. Then it's brought through to a projector low in the side of the wall, and that sends a beam of light along the fiber optic cable. So there's no electricity in the actual lights. The fiber optic goes across the surface of the soil in the planting area. Yes, that's the beauty of it.、Mm. The shrubs will soon grow to cover it up, of course, and then the cable goes past a wooden post, which is between the shrubs and can be a support for them as they grow bigger. And then runs up into each element of the installation. So the light beam is carried up to the top of each element, and illuminates a kind of conical glass cap.、Mm -hmm. I see. Is that the bit which would glow in the dark? Yes. And what's the cap supported on? Is it a wall? No, it's a slender acrylic rod. Uh, like the stem of a flower or mushroom, which the cable runs up inside of. Well, I'll be interested to see the final drawings.、Oh, thank you. 
I'm looking forward to putting it all together. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about the early history of cinema. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, we all take the wonders of the cinema very much for granted these days, but cinema really is a very recent phenomenon. It has moved from its origins in the simple still camera to the dazzling computer-generated graphics of today in little over a hundred years. Perhaps the real beginning of cinema was the cinematograph, a moving camera invented by the Lumiere brothers. As the excitement at the early screenings of short, simple moving pictures spread, competition developed rapidly, and soon cameras such as the American Biograph were on the market. Advertisements asserted that the Biograph did not shake as much as the cinematograph, Meanwhile, permits were required for outside filming, and import licenses were difficult to obtain for equipment, and there were other difficulties for cameramen. When the Lumiere brothers went to film the crowning of Tsar Nicholas II in Russia in 1896, the camera's ticking noise led people to believe it was a bomb. Although this confusion was resolved, disaster struck at the ceremony, when a stand of spectators collapsed and the huge crowd panicked. The cameramen kept filming. It was the first time such events had been filmed, and this marked the beginning of a new concept of journalism. Well, the technology continued to develop rapidly, and often secretly. The thrill of invention and the prospect of riches to be made drove experimenters along. But historians of cinema face difficulties in establishing if an apparatus functioned in the way that its makers asserted. Everyone was keen to say that their machine was the best, of course. In some cases, however, we do have reliable records or evidence in the equipment itself, and then we can see the details of the evolution of the technology. By about 1890, for example, the Frenchman Marais had arrived at results of startling clarity in sequential images. He also had the idea of recording images on a long strip of paper that unrolled in front of the lens instead of on separate plates, but he found it impossible initially to ensure that this strip would have regular movement. As we step into the 20th century, however, we see much progress has been made, and there are many examples of what we would today recognise as films. Questions of the art form were now as important as questions of what was technologically possible, and filmmakers searched around for ideas to draw on. Comic strips were very popular at the time in newspapers, 
and their structure was applied to the planning of films, which were now being mapped in a series of picture panels. Different innovations were achieved by different types of filmmaker, with a certain amount of rivalry between makers of documentaries and makers of fiction films. One area where documentaries led the way was in the use of travelling shots, although of course fiction films adopted this technique in due course. Various sources for stories were developing, and each would have an impact on the way the story was filmed. For example, filmmakers started to use greater numbers of shots when chase films became popular, because they wanted to show the various stages of the policeman running after the bandit and so on. And it wasn't just different kinds of story that were driving filmmakers to think up new techniques. Other technology also played its part. The telephone was growing in use. And filmmakers came up with the idea of splitting the screen image into two parts to show telephone conversations. All this growing sophistication in the shooting of films began to make the whole process of creating them more challenging. The very first films consisted of single shots, and were straightforward to take from shooting to showing them to audiences. However. As the filming developed into multiple shots, then editing emerged as an essential ingredient of the process. Cinema was growing up. Well, next, I'd like to turn your attention to some of the issues that I believe were. That is the end of part four. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part four.